One of the things that can take a little bit of getting used to when we're working with kinetics and specifically with rate laws is trying to decide which of the various forms of the rate law we need to use for a given type of problem. So let's take a look at a few examples of different types of rate law expressions. So if I've got a you know, pretty standard generic chemical reaction, let's make it a super easy chemical reaction. Let's make it a reaction that just has one reactant. So A goes to product or products. One of the nice things about rate laws is you can actually do a lot of work with rate laws and with kinetics in general without actually knowing what the products of a reaction are. So as long as you know the reactants, you can write out a rate law expression. So for this, my sort of standard rate law expression is the initial rate, the rate at time zero is equal to K times A at time zero raised to some power. So there's my, my uh, generic rate law expression for, uh, for this reaction. Now at that point, there are a couple different types of problems we can look at. One of the problems that we've been looking at and that um, we typically look at first is how do we find that value of X? And most of the time, the way that we find that value of X is by looking at different runs where we systematically vary the concentration and measure the rate. And when we do that, we can determine the value of X based on comparing uh, two runs. So that gives us a standard rate law expression. But there's something that's missing in a rate law expression, or at least it, it seems like it's missing. What is a rate? A rate is a change in something we can measure over a change in time. So typically in a gen chem setting, the things that we measure are concentration. Um, that's, you know, that's sort of how we typically set up a rate law expression. But there are a lot of things we could measure. Um, anything that that's observed can be measured and take that change in the measurable over the change in time. But that means that time is kind of buried in the rate of a rate law expression. And if we're looking at kinetics, if we're looking at rates, time seems like a pretty important thing. So what if we've got a different situation? What if I want to know something like um, you know, uh, what is the concentration of A after you know, seven minutes? And there are a few details missing there, but that type of a problem, that explicitly is asking about something to do with time. It's asking about the concentration after an amount of time has passed. Well, in order to get time out of that rate law expression, we need to do a little bit of math and we need to do a little bit of calculus. Now, a whole bunch of you just puckered up a little bit. Um, in, in this class, in this setting, we're not actually going to do the calculus, but we're going to use the results of calculus. So generic rate law expression as shown there, we can, again, make assumptions for our purposes for you know, a simple first set of conditions. We know that X is equal to zero, one, or two. All right, we've said that those are the only three possible options for us. So what if, 
it's zero. So if x is equal to zero, then let's rewrite that expression. Rate is equal to k times, well, hmm. If it's zero, that concentration term disappears because anything raised to the zero power is just equal to one. So that gives us kind of an interesting situation. That gives us a situation where the rate doesn't depend on the concentration or another way of thinking about that is the rate with which the concentration changes doesn't change over time. Now we could do the same thing, plug in for one and two um, and get similar expressions. So if X equals one, then rate is equal to K times the initial concentration of A. If X equals two, then initial rate is equal to K times concentration of A squared. And what we can do with each of those expressions, if we want to get a time variable into there, if we want to get time explicitly shown, the thing we can do from a calculus sense is to integrate those. So let me scroll that up. And now if we look at integrated forms of those rate law expressions, for x equals zero, for a zeroth order process, what we end up finding is that the concentration of A at time T is equal to negative KT plus concentration at time zero. For those of you who like calculus, this is not an exceptionally difficult derivation. So go ahead and give it a shot. Um, if you're a little rusty on calculus or if you just don't do calculus, um, let's just use the result. There's the result. I can integrate separately for all of these. If I do the first order integrated rate law, turns out that that is natural log of A at time T is equal to negative KT plus natural log of A at time zero. And if we do the second order uh, integrated rate law, we find that it's one over the concentration of A at time T is equal to KT, no negative in this one, plus one over concentration of A at time zero. So now we've got three different integrated rate laws. And those three integrated rate laws give us a way to relate initial concentration, final concentration, and the time that we're doing the reaction. The only deal with these is you have to know which form you're using. You have to know whether something is first, second, or zero, or zero first or second order um, in order to choose the right rate law. So that's an integrated rate law. If you run into a problem that's asking about specifically time and concentration changing over time, you're probably looking at an inter integrated rate law expression. Now, why do we integrate these? What's What's the point of doing that extra math? Well, if you look at all three of these expressions, right, and let me just jot down zeroth order integrated rate law, first order integrated rate law, and second order integrated rate law. All three of those 
expressions, all three of those integrated rate laws. Hmm. What kind of equations are those? Those are all equations of a line. And here's a little secret, nine times out of 10, if a chemist is gonna do a whole bunch of calculus, the reason they're gonna do a bunch of calculus is to make something into a line. We like lines. Lines are easy for us to understand. Lines are easy for us to work with. So if you ever see a chemist doing a bunch of math, they're probably doing a bunch of math to try to find a linear form of something. So here we've got linear forms. So um, turn that down just a little bit. We've got y and y and y is equal to m and m and m times x and x and x plus b. So these are all lines. And what that means is that if I have data, if I'm following a concentration as time passes, I can actually use an integrated rate law to determine the order. Well, that seems backwards. I just said that in order to use the integrated rate law, we need to know the order. But what if I've got some set of data And that set of data is something I'm going to plot. And let's plot concentration on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Over time, concentration goes down, right? If it goes down linearly, then it must be a zeroth order. Because if it's not zero order, then this is gonna be a different line. Whoops, let me undo that. Different line and often not even a line, right? Often a curve. So we can determine integrated rate laws, we can determine orders in some cases with this type of an experiment by plotting concentration versus time, natural log of concentration versus time, and one over concentration versus time. And only one of those is going to be linear. Whichever one is linear tells us what the order is with respect to um, with respect to that reactant. So there's a little bit about um, different forms of rate laws, regular uh, standard form of the of the rate law, and then the integrated rate laws for first, second, and zero order processes. All right. I think we should hang it up for there and I will see you next time.